I've had a few successes repairing video cards over the last year or so, but I don't consider myself an expert. I'm really still learning as I go, and because of this, I still feel like there's a lot of risk every time I work on these things. True, they are already broken, but you can make a bad situation worse, and I have made my fair share of mistakes. I've had a few people reach out to me over the last few months asking if I could repair their cards, but at this point, I really still prefer to work on my own hardware. And because this is just a hobby of mine, well, finding the time is a whole other issue too. But having said all that, I did make an exception to this rule recently. Sometimes you get an offer you just can't refuse. I've been looking for a 3DFX Voodoo 4 for a very long time. It's one of the few 3DFX cards I'm missing from my collection. They're actually really hard to find, and when you do find them, the prices are just outrageous these days. So when I was offered a Voodoo 4 in return for an attempt to fix a few things, I was all ears. So these items here belong to none other than Geekenspiel, that's right, the king of retro stickers and flair. If you're active in the retro community, I'm sure you've already seen his stuff, but if not, head over to his site and check out what he has on offer there. I'll include a link in the description. He's got a huge selection of stickers and something for everyone. Perfect for putting those final touches on your prized retro build. I got a bunch of stickers from him recently, and I'm sure you'll be seeing them in some upcoming videos. So he sent me four video cards to look at, a Diamond Stealth Visa Local Bus card and three Voodoo 3 3000s. And at the last minute, I agreed to take a look at a pair of 486 motherboards too. None other than the famous PC Chips M919 with the fake cash chips. And as an added bonus, he said I could keep one of the two motherboards if I could fix one of them for him. I'm really happy to report though that I have already had some success with his parts. I was able to fix one of the two motherboards, it just had a bad regulator or actually should I say NPN transistor in the case of this model. I was also really happy that I could fix his Diamond Stealth VLB card. It's a pretty rare 2 plus 2 model that has sockets to take it to the full 4 megabytes. There really aren't very many VLB cards out there that can support 4 megs, so it is pretty special. But it never worked with 4 megs installed. As soon as you populated the sockets, and really didn't matter what kind of memory was in there, it just artifacted really badly. I was able to narrow the issue down to a factory soldering defect from almost 30 years ago when the card was first made. Two socket pins had a solder bridge across them. Pretty easy fix with a bit of flux and a quick reflow, and now it works perfectly with the full 4 megs. So yeah, off to a good start, but now for the main event, so to speak. Three Voodoo 3s, all with similar problems. Varying degrees of artifacting and lockups in 3D games. It's uh, kind of funny to have a trio of 3000s in front of me again. A few months ago, I bought three dead cards and I was able to repair them. But in that case, two of them just had uh, VBIOS issues and the other, well, it might have just been dirt. But this time, I doubt it's going to be quite so simple. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not totally confident I'm going to be able to repair all three here, but I'll definitely try my best. So like last time, I've affectionately named these cards Card 1, Card 2, and Card 3. Yeah, I know, I'm so sentimental. <laughs> Let's take a quick look at each one here. So Card 1 is a pretty interesting Voodoo 3. This is by far the oldest one I've seen with a 1.0 BIOS release. It's uh, got Siemens memory too, which is actually not all that common. This one here is a TV out model. It's got an S-Video connection on the back there. And doesn't look like it's tied to any OEMs like Gateway or Dell like a lot of them are. Card really looks super clean and really at first glance I don't see anything wrong with it at all. Card number two is actually kind of the polar opposite of card number one. This is actually a very late release. It's a 2.15 um, BIOS and it's a Gateway uh, OEM card. And uh, this one, I can already see a few concerning things with it. I'm not sure how well this shows up on video, but there's actually a pretty nasty bend in that PCB there. So that's a bit of a concern, especially with BGA-based chips like the Voodoo 3s here. Um, I can also see some damage to this electrolytic capacitor in the corner here. It's actually completely detached from the, the pad nearest the uh, memory chip there. So that'll have to be, be dealt with as well. Card number three is also an interesting one. This is actually the first third-party branded Voodoo 3 I've ever seen. This one here is the ASUS V3300. And really, it looks exactly like the reference design, so I'm not sure if ASUS just got these from STB and resold them, or if they actually made their own. This one here has a fairly early 1.20 BIOS release on it. Uh, doesn't have S, uh, an S-Video TV out port on it. But uh, like the first card, this one actually looks really clean and yeah, don't see anything physically wrong with it, so. 
So as much as I'd love to do another repair-a-thon video and work on all three of these, I think they're going to need quite a bit of work and the video would just be way too long. So I'm going to look at card one today and depending on how that goes, I'll look at card three as well. Card two is probably going to be a bit of a special case, so I'll save that one for a future video. So for testing this card, I'm going to use an AMD Socket A system. This is the MSI KT266 Pro with a 1.3 GHz Thunderbird chip. I've used this system for testing later 3DFX cards in the past, and it works really well for that purpose. I've got uh, Windows 98 Second Edition on an SD card here, and everything's ready to go with the correct drivers already installed. So according to Geek and Spiel, this card artifacts in 2D and 3D and suffers from lockups. So let's get it installed and see what we get. All the text mode stuff looked good in the BIOS, and the card was detected in Windows just fine, but I can definitely see some artifacting at the Windows desktop. There's a bunch of diagonal dots, I guess you could call them, and a bit of a repeating pattern here. It's not severe, but definitely noticeable and consistent. I'm going to do the good old squeeze test first to see if the artifacting changes at all. This is a great way to identify flaky solder joints and BGA issues. So I'm squeezing both the core and each individual memory chip. Obviously, make sure you're well grounded before trying something like this. But yeah, didn't change anything at all with the artifacting. So I think it's time to launch a 3D game. Let's give GL Quake a try. Yeah, it's alive enough to display the logo, but it completely locked up the system. You can see the console window was just starting to lift up to display the game before it crashed. So I did uh, try this several times, and it was very consistently crashing every single time. So this is really looking like a memory problem so far, but there's one more test I want to try. I'm going to use the 3DFX overclocking utility to underclock the card as far as it'll go from 166 megahertz down to 100 megahertz. Uh, remember the core and memory clock speed is linked on the Voodoo 3, so it will be reducing both. But the reason I want to try this is because flaky or failing memory will usually improve somewhat when the frequency is reduced. It basically takes some of the strain off the memory. If it's a broken trace or a bad passive on the memory bus or something like that, it's not really likely to improve at the lower frequency. So just another useful data point to have. So after rebooting, I can definitely see an improvement. The dot artifacts are still there, but if you remember before, there were a lot more at the higher frequency. So let's try GLQuake again and see if we get any further. Yes, indeed. Well, <laughs> kind of. It's pretty short-lived, but I'd say that's way better than before. All right, so let's talk strategy here. So artifacting and instability like this it's almost always something related to video memory. Not necessarily the chips themselves, although that is often the case, but could be trace damage, bad solder joints, or even a faulty SMD component on the memory bus. All these things definitely should be checked before going to the trouble of swapping out chips. Another big variable to consider is the Voodoo 3 Avenger chip itself. BGA chips like this can suffer from solder ball detachment or cracks and some of these will connect to the memory bus. But I'm feeling pretty good about this being a bad memory chip because none of the squeeze tests I did had any effect. And the fact that underclocking the card improved the artifacting instability, I think is another good sign. So first things first, to really inspect any of these cards, I have no choice but to remove the heat sinks. And to be perfectly honest, I don't like touching these if I don't have to because removing them can be very risky. Some amount of pressure is needed to get these off, and if your BGA connectivity is already flaky, you can completely kill the card. Even though 3DFX uses these nice metal spring-loaded clips, um, they obviously didn't trust them enough because all Voodoo 3 3000s have some kind of adhesive holding the heatsink on. Removing these clips is not enough to get it off. If you're lucky it's got an adhesive thermal pad, those aren't too bad to get off, but if you're unlucky, It'll be glued on with some really nasty epoxy-like stuff. Thankfully, all of Geek & Spiel's cards uh, use these metallic adhesive thermal pads. And yeah, they're kind of interesting. It's almost like a thick piece of aluminum foil with an adhesive layer on each side. I've heard of a lot of different techniques for getting these off, including freezing the card or using a heat gun to soften up the adhesive. I know that the freezing method does work for glued on ones. But nothing really extreme is needed for the ones with the thermal pads like these. What I had success doing was just to install it in the system and let it idle for about 20 to 30 minutes until the heatsink got nice and hot. 
Then I was able to just gently pry it off with a small flathead screwdriver. But the way you pry it off is obviously very important. You absolutely have to make sure you protect the substrate part of the chip um, as you pry because the uh, sharp edge of a screwdriver will gouge into it. And if you do that, you're gonna have a really bad day. But while it's still hot, you should feel it start to detach with just a very small amount of pressure. And you'll probably have to repeat this a few times around the chip in different spots until it finally lets go. But yeah, check out that old school 3DFX logo. I've never seen one like that on a Voodoo 3. But yeah, now that the heat sinks off, I can thoroughly inspect it and check all the memory pins for good contact and just make sure that there's nothing I'm missing before I start replacing these chips. So not surprisingly, everything looks just fine. All the memory chips seem well attached and all of the passive resistors and resistor networks around the memory and Avenger chip are good. I don't see any PCB damage whatsoever. So yeah, I think chances are one or more of the SD RAM chips are probably bad on this thing. So that's the direction we're gonna go. The Voodoo 3 uses 50 pin TSOP SD RAM in a 512K by two banks by 16 bit configuration. That's a bit of a mouthful. But basically total of two megabytes per chip and there's eight chips on the card. The 3000 has a clock frequency of 166 megahertz, so it needs at least six nanosecond or 166 megahertz rated SD RAM. And this is what comes with it from the factory. But after doing some digging online, I was happy to discover that there's still some manufacturers making compatible memory for these. One of them being Winbond, which is a reputable company with a long history. And as an added bonus, they have both six nanosecond and five nanosecond memory available. Both are the same price at only $2 per chip. So obviously I bought the five nanosecond stuff, which should be good for up to 200 megahertz. I got these chips here from Mouser and I uh, picked up some extras too, because yeah, you really never know just how long they're gonna be available for, so. So yeah, unless one chip is way hotter or colder than the rest, I don't really have a reliable way to figure out which is bad, but I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you have any methods for identifying problematic chips. The four at the top of the card do get a few degrees warmer than the others, probably because they're a bit closer to the Avenger chip. Hey, at least it's something to go on, so I'll definitely start up there. But yeah, sadly, it's gonna be a bit of a game of chance. And because it's been a while, and I would really like to know which chip is bad, I'm gonna replace them one at a time. It's also way easier for me to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. But anyway, let's get started. So I just picked a random chip at the top of the card to start with. I'm gonna be using hot air to remove these, so I like to put Captain Tape on nearby passives just to prevent them from being disturbed. I'm gonna put a generous amount of flux on all the pins here as well to help with the solder flow. My hot air station is an 858D, which is a very popular model that's a pretty good price. I'm going to be using a temperature of 390 degrees Celsius or 734 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hard to see exactly what I'm doing in the video, but I am not applying any upward pressure or prying at the chip at all here. I'm just very gently pushing the knife blade forward under the chip. So when the solder melts and the chip lets go, it'll start to slide underneath and I know it's safe to lift it up. I know that there are suction cup uh, based lifters out there and I did buy one actually but it just never worked well for me. And there it is, looks like it came off pretty cleanly. By the way I do this out of my garage with the door open and an exhaust fan close to the card because of all the smoke and fumes. Always important to have good ventilation when you're working with hot air or soldering. All the soldering work I'm going to do today will be at a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius or 750 Fahrenheit. I'm going to be using a fairly fine point conical tip at 0.5 millimeters. I believe it's the Hako T18B if I'm not mistaken. I find it's a great all-purpose size that conducts heat really well. Some of the finer tips need a higher temperature to work properly and I have had some issues with the 0.2 millimeter one I have because of this. So I just stick with this one and it works really well for most of what I need to do. So with the chip off, it's now time to get the pads all cleaned up. I'm just adding some more flux here and I'm gonna use some copper wick to get all the old solder off. By the way, using good quality wick can make a huge difference. I really like MG Chemicals Super Wick. Really good stuff and after you try it, you'll never wanna go back to the cheap stuff again, that's for sure. Once I got all the old solder off, I gave the area a good cleaning with some isopropyl alcohol, which is always very important and now it's time to get the new chip on. I'm just adding some fresh flux to the pads and then I get to go through the very fun task of aligning the pins just right. It can be pretty frustrating at times, but uh, once you get it tacked down on the two opposing corners, it won't move anymore. 
I have tried to do some drag soldering in the past, but I'm not 100% comfortable with the technique yet, so I prefer to just go along with a tiny bit of solder on the iron and just dab at the pins one at a time until they're all done. It's definitely not the fastest way to do this, but it's one way I'm comfortable with, so I'll just stick with it for now. I find that keeping the iron tip as clean as possible and loading it with just a tiny amount of solder works best. I like to go over each pin twice too, just to make sure that it's flowed really well and that the joint is nicely shaped. Can usually do about five or six pins at a time this way, but if I add too much solder, it really just creates more solder bridges, which I'd like to avoid. Thankfully, these chips are only 25 pins per side, so it wasn't too bad. And considering it's been a while since I've done this, I think it turned out pretty good. On my first try, there was just one pin that was a bit flaky, but it was an easy fix. It's always a good idea to inspect everything again after getting the flux cleaned up. It can save you some frustration later on. I think the final product looks pretty good. Time to test the card out. And yeah, to be honest, with a 1 in 8 chance of finding the bad chip, I don't really expect it to be fixed. But what I am most interested in is whether the wind bond replacements are compatible, as they should be, and at the very least that the card isn't any more broken than it was before. And yep, as expected, it wasn't the one, but on a positive note, <laughs> the card is the exact same level of broken, so I'm going to stick with the plan and continue on. I stuck with the top row and the second and third chips went without a hitch, but sadly the artifacting was unchanged. I was working on the fourth and last chip on the top row when I noticed capacitor C56. Looks like there was some hot air collateral damage. Even though it was taped down, it was, shall we say, disturbed a bit. Still hanging on there, but I really don't like the look of it, so it's got to get reattached. I'm just going to hang on to it with some tweezers here, and then heat up the pads to get it off. Then I'm going to clean up the pads with some copper wick, and I'm going to add some fresh flux and get reattached properly. With that sorted out, I can now continue on with soldering another 50 pins. I gotta say I was hopeful that the bad chip would have been on the top row, but those pesky artifacts just persisted. It was time to move on to the chips on the side of the card, and my natural thinking was to just start from the top and work my way down, but I was actually speaking to my wife about this chip lottery I'm playing, and she told me that I should do the complete opposite of what I wanted to do, so I listened to her, and I started from the bottom instead. Since I was planning to recap the card anyway, I removed the electrolytic capacitor that was in front of the chip just to get it out of the way. All right, so I've got the fifth chip replaced, card cleaned up, put back in. Let's see what happens. This is always quite nerve wracking because the uh, Windows loading screen and the text-based stuff always looks fine. Gotta wait till I get to the Windows desktop here. Oh! <laughs> it's gone! No way. All of the uh, diagonal dots are gone. That is awesome. I think that might have been the one, the fifth chip. I gotta say, that feeling never gets old. That is so awesome. Okay, let's let's launch Jailquake. That's really the true test here. Crashed right away last time. Yeah, I don't see the uh, red dots that were going up and down the screen there at the logo. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's working. Fantastic. I don't see any anomalies at all. Nice and smooth. Oh, that's so exciting. Yep, that must be the one. By the way, uh, if you do see some flickering in the HUD down at the bottom, that's uh, an issue with the uh, mini GL version uh, that I have installed for GL Quake. Just ignore that. Everything else on the screen looks looks great. Anyway, I don't want to speak too soon. I do have to put it through some more rigorous uh, stability testing. I'll probably launch uh, Quake 3 or Unreal Tournament or something a little more demanding and see what happens. But yeah, it, it got through the first demo here. That looks good. So the uh, the next question, of course, is uh, I did five chips and they're all 200 megahertz uh, rated. Um, three more are left on the card that are 166 megahertz rated. If it was me, I'd definitely change those out for 200 megahertz rated chips too. But uh, I'll definitely check with Geek and Spiel and see what he wants to do. I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll want to change those three out as well. But I do want to give him the chance, since uh, or the uh, the choice, I should say, because you know there are, there is some risk associated with replacing these. You know things can go wrong. You could lift a pad or something like that. So now that it's working, I definitely want to give him the uh, the choice. 
All right, so I had a chance to talk to Geek and Spiel, and as expected, he'd like to go all the way with this card and get the remaining three chips replaced. And really, I would have done the same thing, especially with only three left on there. I think it only makes sense. I'm not really sure how much overclocking headroom will be on tap with this really early revision Avenger core, but I gotta believe that the 166 megahertz rated SDRAM must be holding it back to some degree. So before I swap these out, I will do some overclocking, run some benchmarks, and see just how far it can go like this, and then compare it again once I'm finished with the replacements. I'm gonna do a couple of other things too to this card as well. I'm gonna get all of the electrolytic caps replaced with uh, some good quality Panasonic FK series ones. And I'm gonna get the BIOS updated to the latest release too. So yeah, even though it's fixed, everything I do now is only gonna make it better than before, which is quite exciting. It's really cool when you see something go from the broken pile to a fully functional card to one that's even better than your average 3000. You gotta love it. So after making sure the card was stable, I slowly notched up the frequency until I got to 177 megahertz. Anything beyond that, and I started to see some instability and general weirdness happening. So not quite Voodoo 3 3500 speeds, but really not bad either when you consider there's still 166 megahertz rated memory on there. But the big question, of course, will be if the core can stretch its legs further when the memory limitations have been removed. But very happy and satisfied that 177 megahertz is a stable overclock, so we'll go with that. Since I already knew what chip was bad and was feeling more confident with the techniques I was using, I just went ahead and removed all three chips in one shot. Everything went smoothly except for one tiny little solder bridge that I missed, but I caught it while inspecting the pins and it was an easy fix. I then moved on to replacing all of the electrolytic capacitors. I really have no reason to believe the old ones were bad, but it's always a good maintenance activity on a car that's almost 25 years old. I'm not going to get into capacitor replacement today, but be sure to check out my other Voodoo 3 Repairathon video for a more detailed uh, look at the method I like to use for these. You'll find a link to that uh, video in the description below. And with all the hardware bits out of the way, the final touch is to get the BIOS updated to the latest version from 1.0 all the way up to 2.15.12. And after all that hard work, I was happy to see that the card could go way past the previous ceiling of 177 megahertz, all the way up to 191 megahertz. And really that's with 100% stability too. It can still complete benchmarks a little bit further than that, but that's sort of the safe maximum that I decided to settle with. I wasn't originally planning to include the repair of card three in this video, but because the problem and solution are gonna be pretty much exactly the same as card one, I think it only makes sense. Card 3 had some persistent artifacting at the Windows desktop. Not diagonal dots, but something that looks like a band of colorful interference across the top of the screen, as well as a few patchy spots. And like Card 1, the squeeze test didn't change anything at all. Jailquake was definitely more stable with Card 3 compared to Card 1, but I could see patches of blue artifacting flashing up on the screen, and the game does eventually crash. Underclocking the card does improve the artifacting and stability too, so that's another good data point to have. Didn't see anything wrong with it at all under the microscope, so I think it was time to rinse and repeat. But after getting all that great chip replacement experience with card one, I was feeling good about doing more chips at a time. I started with the three chips on the right hand side. They all came off cleanly, but to my surprise, I found this really bizarre looking spicy pillow on the bottom of one of the SDRAM chips. I'm not sure if the hot air did something to it, but I'd say that definitely doesn't look right to me. Once I got the three new Winbond chips on, I was feeling more optimistic than usual because of what I saw, and sure enough, the artifacting was gone. I suspect the swollen chip might have been the one, but it was definitely one of those three anyway. I could have just left well enough alone at this point and called the card fixed, but yeah, you know me. I really wanted to get them all changed out for good measure, and to see if I could get any closer to that magical 200 megahertz mark with this card. I didn't bother replacing the rest in batches, and I just did all five at once. I think the experience I got doing this so many times is starting to show a bit. Check out those solder joints. I think they look way cleaner than the first couple I did, that's for sure. So like card one, I gave it the full treatment, replaced all the caps, and flashed the BIOS to the latest release as well. Everything really went well, and I was sincerely hoping for a better overclock, but yeah, it's not always the way these things go, unfortunately. After thoroughly testing, I was able to achieve a 191 megahertz overclock. That's right, the exact same overclock as card one. I couldn't push it even one or two megahertz further without some instability showing up. But hey, that's okay. Still way better than your average 3000. 
and it would have no problem running all day long at Voodoo 3 3500 speeds. I honestly can't say I felt a huge difference in a game like Quake 3, but the numbers definitely don't lie. At 800 by 600 and high detail, we get a jump from 81.7 to 92.2 frames per second, or an increase of about 13%. And as expected, it beats out the Voodoo 3 3500 by a couple frames per second too. 3D Mark 99 was a pretty demanding benchmark when the Voodoo 3 was released that same year, and we see some pretty similar gains here too, from about 6,800 points to over 7,700. That's a gain of about 14%. Not bad at all. Well, I gotta say, it was super satisfying to get these cards fixed, and not only fixed really, but enhanced to a state better than before. Not gonna lie, it was a lot of work, but it was totally worth it in the end. Great learning experience as always, and I feel like I'm a lot more confident with memory chip replacement now too, which is not too surprising. That was a lot of chips. <laughs> but amazingly, this is the seventh and eighth 3DFX card that I've repaired, which is just really hard to believe. But I was talking to Geek and Spiel a few times throughout the repairs, and I mentioned to him that I'd love to be able to leave my signature, so to speak, on some of the items that I've worked on. And he was more than happy to help me out. He designed and printed these awesome stickers for me to use for that purpose. Check out that Mega Man inspired logo. I really love it. But uh, one of them has a uh, nice metallic backing on it and the other a plain white backing. So be seeing some of these around, I'm sure. And uh, he also did a couple of other cool stickers for me too, including this uh, fan sticker that provides some pretty big boosts and cooling performance. But I'm really thrilled that I was able to fix his two Voodoo 3s here and that I'm able to proudly display his sticker on the back of them. So thanks again, Geek and Spiel. Really appreciate it. But hey, not quite done yet. Card 2 is still sitting here broken in need of some TLC. So hopefully I'll have some success with it in the coming days and weeks. So stay tuned for some more. By the way, I know I've been doing a lot of repair videos these last few months, so I'm probably going to try and take a break from them for a little bit and work on a few retro hardware reviews and retrospectives, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you enjoy the repair stuff, or would you rather see more of a balance with the other types of content? But thanks for watching, everyone, and please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more retro PC content like this. And as always, be sure to check the description below for some useful links and additional information. Thanks again.